Luke chapter 1, verse 26. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed, be, blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you'll conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He'll be great, be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? The angel answered said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also, the Holy One who is born will be called the Son of God. Now, indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month of her who has called barren. For with God nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. I want to talk to you today about God's perfect timing. God's perfect timing. There are 456 prophecies in the Old Testament that Jesus fulfilled in the New Testament, such as, Micah 5.2 tells us that Jesus, the Messiah, will be born in Bethlehem. Now, think about the fact that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, a city that he was not from and would never be expected to be born in Bethlehem because he was actually a Nazarite from Nazareth. Just happened to be, happened, happened, happened to be um, at the right place at the right time to fulfill that scripture. Just happened to be some, some 500 to 1,000 years before Micah talks about that particular fact, 500 years to 1,000 years later, it happened. Perfect timing. Amazing. So there's 456 prophecies that just happened to come to pass. Talked about him coming in in this triumphal entry with, on a donkey. Amazing. It just happens to have that little cult there and different things and and just so many prophecies that we can't, we can't go through them all, but the, the, the Lord is just perfect in his time. It's, it's quite amazing. In um, dealing with just, there was a guy by the name of Peter Stoner. He was a, Peter Stoner, no related to our Saturday evening service, uh, of Westmont College. He was the head of, I believe, the math department there or but he took the math department and approximately 600 students and figured out the statistics in a conservative manner of what would be the statistics and the timing issues that would have to happen for just eight prophecies to come forth, like this one here. Now think about that. Not 456, but they just took some of the some eight of the eight prophecies and they mathematically figured it out what would the possibility be of, you know, Jesus, uh, one man, you know, 500 years down the road, somebody prophesies something, 500 years down the road, it comes to pass, just as the Old Testament said, and it wasn't like they were reading up on it and saying, um, wow, we, oh, Jesus, like, like his parents going, wow, we know he's the Messiah. Wow, we got, we got to get to Bethlehem because he's got to be born there. We got to fulfill that prophecy. They didn't even, I mean, they didn't understand all that stuff. It just happened to be in that place. So they took 600 students and they came up and they, whatever they came up with, they took the most conservative number out of that. So if it was something to one and, and another student got this to one and they took a consensus and then they took the lower of the two, in other words, the, to get it to the, the, the lowest possible common denominator uh, not the highest possibility, but the lowest possibility, or, or actually the opposite of that. And you understand what I'm saying? They, they took the most conservative route 
um, to make sure that they weren't fudging numbers and different things, and they and they did it. So they used this example uh, to start with, and I've got a little basket here with some. Uh, there's just ten tickets in here, and one of them says "winner" on it. There's all the rest of them have nothing on it. So there's just ten tickets in here. Matter of fact, I'll just pull them out here so you guys can so you know I'm not lying to you. You know you know how pastors lie. But uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then ten. Okay, so there's ten tickets in there. One of them has the winner ticket on it. And then you blindfold somebody, and we won't go to that to that degree, but you take somebody and you ask them to come up and, and just pick out, um, let's see, Eric, come up and pick out one ticket. Now, Eric, as you're standing here, I want you to know that the chances are one in ten. Would you agree the chances are one in ten that he picked the right ticket out? But if you don't get this right, then you're going to alter your destiny. Your parents may never have grandchildren. (laughs) There won't be any Christian churches in the world. Uh, Hell will not, hell will be a place of wide and heaven will be impossible. So if you had that possibility of doing that, how many of you would how many of you would take the chance, a one in ten chance of pulling that out if you, you knew that you, there was just a one in ten chance that that, that was a possibility? I mean, I mean, think about it. If you're gambling with all the world domination of things, the Jesus coming, everything else, and you're, you're gambling with that, how many of you would, I mean, would take the chance of pulling one ticket out of ten? I mean, I w- if it was with my kid's life, I mean... I mean, if you, had a, if you had a gun and you, just stand there for a second, but you had a gun and you spun it and there was a 10-shot thing, which there are not that many, but revolvers, but if there was a 10-shot revolver and you spun it and there was only one bullet in it, how many of you would pull that trigger on your son? You wouldn't do it, would you? So, Eric, the world domination is in your hands this morning. If you don't pick the winner, then there is no, there is no Christianity. There is no Christian church. There's nothing. You better pick good. <laughs> you lose. All of history is now altered. Okay. Now there's a one in ten chance that he picks that out of there. But let me give you the real statistics. If you marked on a silver dollar, winner on a silver dollar, and you took the state of Texas and you filled it up two feet high with silver dollars, and you put winner on one silver dollar, and you blindfolded a guy and put him in the middle of Texas and told him he could go anywhere in Texas that he wanted to go, the chances of Jesus fulfilling eight prophecies were that that guy would find the one thing that says winner on it and pull that out. Think about that. The astronomical chances of the 456 prophecies that Jesus fulfilled, we can't even calculate or understand or even come close to understanding the possibility that Jesus fulfilling all 456 prophecies of the Old Testament. Yet he did. And people wonder why we believe this book. This book is not based upon some kind of just faith thing that we just throw ourselves into and it doesn't matter. This book is amazingly accurate that Jesus fulfilled all those prophecies and his parents weren't planning on him being born in Bethlehem. And imagine 456 happenstances of one man And Eric couldn't even pull out one out of ten. Think about that. Incredible, incredible numbers. The whole state of Texas, two feet high, full of silver dollars. And you have to go wherever you want to with being blindfolded 
and pick out the one thing in that whole state of Texas. His timing, my friends, is perfect. There was a guy during the Second World War, his name was David Greenglass. He was a World War II traitor. He gave atomic secrets to the Russians. They fled to Mexico after, he fled to Mexico after the war. Yeah, I better. His conspirators arranged to help him by planning a meeting with the secretary of the Russian ambassador in, in Mexico City. Proper identification for both parties became vital. In other words, they got to know who this guy is. Greenglass was, identified, was to identify himself with six prearranged signs. These instructions had been given to both the secretary and Greenglass so that there would be no possibility of making a mistake. They were, number one, once in Mexico, Greenglass was to write a note to the secretary signing his name as I. Jackson. Second, after three days, he was to go to the Pizza de Colón in Mexico City, or excuse me, Pizza de Colón in Mexico City, and stand before the, stat the statue of Columbus, number three, and number four, with his middle finger placed in a guidebook in addition, when he was approached, he was to say it was a magnificent statue and that he was from Oklahoma. The secretary was then to give him a passport. These things were given to him so there would be uh, an absolute identification of who he was. Jesus fulfilling those prophecies of the Old Testament was an absolute identification of who he was. An absolute identification of who he was. I'm so blown away by this. It just amazes me that... You know, the Bible says in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 through 5, he says, And when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son. Notice the fullness of time had come. God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. At the fullness of time, in other words, Jesus came... And at the timing of God, I'm going to bring this to us here in a second. I'm just talking about Christmas thing, then I'm going to bring it to us here in a second. The timing of God was absolutely essential. Romans 5, 6 says, For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Jesus came to earth, when he came to earth, he came at the absolute soonest that he could come, and the perfect time that he, he came. It was interesting because before the time of Jesus, there was no roads in the, in the area. And to preach like Jesus did, to have the ministry that Jesus hit, did, it would be essential that you have roads from tra to travel the, on his travel schedule. The Roman Empire took over, and Jesus got to travel on all the roads, and it was just the perfect time. There was a language out there called, and it's the Greek language, which is where we get our, um, a lot of our translations come from the Greek manuscripts to the New Testament. The Greek language was out there. It was a universal language that pretty much everybody spoke. It's kind of like the English language today. Most everywhere you go in the world, we're kind of an arrogant bunch because when we go to Japan, we expect people to speak English to us. We were in France, uh, I don't know, was it a couple of years ago, whatever, a couple of three years ago, and... And we, you know, got a few French words because they told people if you at least tried to speak their language, um, then they didn't treat you so bad. <laughs> and, and so we sp spoke a few French words, um, and, but pretty much we relied upon them to speak English to us. In the Philippines, the, the, the language is, Tagalog is the central language with many dialects, but everybody learns English. And I don't know if you know this, but when international airline pilots go into any international airport in the world, whether a French guy is coming to America or, or a French guy is coming to France, if a French pilot is going to France, he doesn't speak French to the air traffic controllers in France. He speaks English. Every air traffic controller, am I, Steve, am I right on that? He, Steve's an international pilot. And... Everywhere Steve flies across the world, and he'll fly to Bangkok and different places, 
the, the universal language is English everywhere you go in the world. Well, Greek was like that language, so everybody kind of knew the language, had a, some interpretation of it, so that language was set for Jesus to go out there and really disciples and everybody else and to preach the gospel and people could understand because it was kind of the universal language at the time. There have been many years of Greek philosophy and different things of false gods and different things and people were hungry at that time for something different. The Roman Empire had risen up and really taken over people's lives and people thought that the Messiah needed to come and set up his kingdom and wipe the Roman Empire out. And it was a perfect time. The timing of Jesus coming to this earth was stunningly and amazingly perfect, perfect timing. Habakkuk 2, uh, 2, 2 says this, The Lord answered and said, Write the vision down, make it plain on tablets, that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. But the end it will speak, it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Galatians 6, 9 says, Be not weary, or let us not grow weary in doing good. In due season, you'll reap if you don't lose heart. You see, my brothers and sisters, when we deal with us in perfect timing, it seems like the operative word in perfect timing is what would you say the operative word in perfect timing is? How about wait? Anybody ever heard that word before? Wait. If there's anything, it seems like we'll talk about that just a little bit, but God is the alpha and omega, the beginning and the end. He, the alpha means the beginning and omega means the end. He's the alpha, he's the beginning and the end of our lives. He's, the, our lives run together with God. We, we look at our lifespan as you know, born and die at 87 years old, born September 16th, 1959, and die at 87 years old. And we look at a lifespan, but God doesn't look at a lifespan. It's, he's the Alpha Omega. They run together. The beginning and the end run together. So in God's perfect timing for our lives, we pray, we set our faith, we believe God, and it doesn't happen on what we consider our time frame. So we get frustrated and we say, well, there is no God. And he sees the beginning from the end. He's the Alpha Omega, and so he's working everything, and there's things, and you're praying and believing God for, and you're setting your faith, but you didn't know that for you to accomplish or for him to accomplish that thing that you prayed about take somebody else and they got to put them in place and that situation's got to be in place and that got to be in place and that's got to be in place and that one's got to be in place and that's got to be in place and all of a sudden you walk into it and you go, wow, how did we get here? Because you were on God's perfect timing. If Jesus, and my point is just simply this this morning, if God knew how to bring Jesus at the specific time and fulfill all those scriptures, just perhaps... He may know how to run your life, too. I'm mean, just saying. He might just have a thought process about your life also. If every day we get up and, you know, we go duck hunting and, and uh, we have to check the schedule each day because of the time of, of taking pictures of the ducks <laughs> changes every day. The only pictures we take are dead ducks. But... Um, but it changes every day, so we have to keep time, and we have to show this is coming up. It's you know, it's a uh, half hour before shooting light, so this is when we do this, and da 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 da. We have to keep time. But it's amazing that they can write this back in June, get it out for us, or back in January, whatever it is, for the next year. They can tell when it's legal to shoot because they set the, you can set your clock by the timing of the Earth, and God's timing is perfect. So when the Lord says to you, <laughs> when the Lord says to you, uh, you go out there, you pray, you believe God, it doesn't happen, perhaps, maybe, it's not the fullness of time for the prefer perfect situation for you to have it happen. Just perhaps, maybe, all of our discouragement is wasted because God's working out the Alpha and Omega in our lives ahead of time, doing all these kind of things, and at his perfect time, he's going to slap it on you, and you're going to go, oh, my God, that's a miracle. 
But we spend our time frustrated and seeking after things that we shouldn't necessarily seek after things and doing things we shouldn't be doing and all these kind of things. And we waste a lot of energy in our lives. I remember when we were dealing on this building and John Bishop and I, a pastor of Living Hope, would talk. And we'd say, look, look, we're, let's, let's get this place where let's, we want your old building and you want this and you want this property. And, and we said, well, we're just going to do that. And, we're, and so we pray, believe God. And, and, and so we thought it was going to happen. We thought it was going to happen right on my time schedule three years ago. And I see now it would have been impossible to happen three years ago. But just this last week, we closed on all the property out in front of us. John got our old building. We got 14 acres with all the houses. The Gabriel house is up and running. And John and I looked at each other and we talk on the phone. We say, you know what? I think you and I both did a whole lot of worrying about nothing. Because we didn't see that it would take three years. What we thought would take three months took three years. But now the finances are there to do it. The situation was right to do it. Everything was perfect, and it happened. But it wasn't on Glenn Johnson's time frame. And I think the biggest frustration we have in life is waiting on that perfect time. Let me give you three quick thoughts on this. Three quick thoughts. Number one, God's never in a hurry. You ladies looking for a spouse. You men looking for a spouse. The Lord is not in a hurry. Your homo hormones are. <laughs> and I can't tell you the amount of people that we have asked, please don't do this. Please wait. And they did not. And their marriage did not also. But there's something about waiting for God's timing in that situation where, hey, I'm going I'm to set my family, I'm going to believe God. And, 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 then, you know, and then you might ask questions like this, ladies. Here's a, an amazing question to ask somebody that you're dating. Do you have a job? <laughs> yes, I do. I will date you. No, I don't. Not the will of God. Mm-hmm. You show me the money, I'll show you the honey. After you're married, of course. But the timing issue, the, we, think of, we think about people, famous people that, that got out of the will of God and, and got a timing issue. Look at the greatest messing up of a timing issue in the Bible. It was done by our father of the faith, Abraham. God says, you're going to have a son. And when you have this son, he's going to be the heir. Uh, he's going to start the whole Jewish race as we know it today. So they got clipping along there, and Abraham's like this old dude, and parts aren't working as good as they used to. And he's married to a hot-looking 75-year-old, 8-year-old lady, and, and their parts aren't probably working there very well. And, but God says, you're going to have a son. And so they get together, and 10, 15 years goes by. 20 years goes by. Nothing happens. So Sarah comes up with a great idea. She comes up and says, well, you know what? It's kind of a tradition that if I can't bear you children, then why don't you just come into one of my maids and have relations with her, and we'll bear a son, and we'll, and, and we'll, go, we'll, we'll shortcut the process here. And, of course, Abraham says, oh, no, I don't want to do that, like every male would do, you know, I don't want to do that. And of course, he, he says, well, yeah, I'm in on that. I mean, duh, my wife's wanting me to have relations with another one. Duh, I mean, I'm in on that. Quiet in here. You can laugh. It's okay. <laughs> Joke right here. So he goes in, and, and he gets Hagar pregnant. And she, she has a son named Ishmael. And all of a sudden, God, something happens, and Sarah gets pregnant, and they have a son named Isaac. Sarah looks at all of her finally laid plans, and she walks up and she said, you, I have the heir of promise, you and your son are out of here. 
bye-bye, gone. And from Ishmael, Abraham still being his father, comes the Islamic race that we know today. And from Isaac comes the Jewish race that we know today. And Sarah got ahead of the schedule because and messed up the timing on the thing and really made a, a mess out of things. Remember this scripture? James chapter 1, verse 4. Are you all out here today? Are you okay? Okay, just making sure. Some of you are going, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. James chapter 1, verse 4 says, But let patience have its perfect work, that you might be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. When patience is allowed to work in your life, you will eventually be complete, lacking nothing. When patience is not in your life, you'll probably be without whatever you thought you were going to get. I wonder how many things we've messed up. Number two, so God, number one, God's not in a hurry. Number two, obedience to his plan will pay off in the end. Remember the story of, this is an interesting story, where the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 9, man, he struck down the road to Damascus. Man, light shines on him. He goes blind, and, and first thing he asks, he said, who are you? And, and Jesus says, well, it's, it's me. And he says, well, what must I do? And he tells him, he says, man, you're going to suffer for my name's sake. You're going to go out and preach the gospel. And we think that the Apostle Paul went off the donkey, onto the ground, blind, and next week he's in the temple preaching the gospel. No, no. When did the Apostle Paul become the Apostle Paul? Well, it's in Acts chapter 13. Verse 1 says, now in the churches that was, that, that was at Antioch, and by the way, the Apostle Paul was a member of a local church, if your ministry is greater than the Apostle Paul, then that's when you don't have to be a member of a local church. Now in the churches that was at Anak, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, of Lucius of Cyrene, the man who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. And having fasted and prayed, laid hands on them and sent them away. This was 15 years after the road to Damascus. 15 years, the Apostle Paul says that he was a prophet and teacher, so he moved up the ladder from just a, from an ordinary Christian. He moved up the ladder to a prophet and a teacher, and then here he got separated into the apostolic ministry 15 years. They say it was 13 to 15 years after the call of God was on his life. Did the Apostle Paul change the world? I mean, come on, man. We're reading from the Apostle Paul. We're reading some of his things. He changed the world, but I believe he changed the world because he understood the timing issue. And this man, 15 years, was the most knowledgeable man of the Old Testament there was at the time, probably. And it took 15 years of God's timing, and he changed the world because of it. God is not in a hurry in your life. It's obedient to the plan and the purpose and obedient not only to the plan, but obedient to the process. And processes take time. Finally, the scripture we want to talk about is that whole thing about weight. Galatians 6, 9, let us go, not, I read this already. Let us not grow weary in well-doing. For in due season you shall reap if, here's the if, if, say if, if, you do not lose heart. Let me translate that into the Glenn Johnson version. Let us not be weary in well-doing as seeking a spouse, for you shall reap if your hormones don't get in the way. That's 4th John. Oh, wait a minute, there is no 4th John. Isaiah says this, last scripture. Isaiah 40, 31 says this. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings like eagles. They'll run and not be weary. They'll walk and not faint. This is not the weight of inactivity, but a weight of activity like a waiter or waitress waiting on a table. So the weight here is a weight, yes, of I'm waiting on the Lord to bring this person to pass or this person to pass. I'm waiting, but... My weight is not sitting in a chair of non-activity, but my weight here is a weight of worship, serving, giving, prayer, get involved somewhere. It's a weight of I'm waiting on the Lord in the sense of I'm waiting Him like I'm waiting on Him, like I'm waiting on a table. I'm, I'm, I'm serving Him. I'm 
loving him. I'm honoring him. I'm, I'm going after him. I'm involved in my church. I'm in doing the things that I'm supposed to be doing. I'm, I'm waiting upon the Lord. That's when the timing of the Lord becomes perfect. So I submit to you, in conclusion, that why do we get so stressed out? Why do we, I'm talking to Glenn Johnson here, why do we worry so much and freak out about so many things when God's over here, the Alpha Omega, and he's, we're praying, we're believing, we don't see anything happening, but in the, our sphere of influences, we're trying to live our lives, we're walking down the road. You have to understand that there's angels over here moving things around, they're you know, making that happen and moving this around and making that happen and putting this over there and that thing over there and this thing over there and the angels are boom over here and boom, 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 and they're working this out and we just say, well, I give up. I guess there is no God. And the angels go, okay, I'll quit working then. I'll just quit working. We were going to bring that to pass. 36 hours from now, we were going to bring that to pass. We had everything in line, but they gave up. They gave up on the process and the timing of the Lord. Now, I've learned one, one thing. I was born impatient, and I've improved on it. <laughs> and if I could be the Lord, I would, I would move this thing train a little faster. But I would probably mess up the whole entire world if I did. So he orchestrates things and business plans and situations and moving that here and putting that and that's got to be in place and that's got to be in place. And, you know, that person, and they're saying this is going to happen and that person's not even born yet who will be born and is going to lead and different things like that and that's going to happen and that's going to happen. You know, some of our things in, that we saw even in our worship, you know, is Adam a great worship leader in the team? Is, aren't they great in their worship? But understand some of this. Understand some of this. Most of the people on this stage, when the dream was born for the worship that we have, weren't even born. Did you think about that? that most, almost everybody on this stage, almost everybody this morning, almost everybody, when the dream of this worship going from out this place, they weren't even a, they weren't even a thought in their parents' mind. I don't know whether the Lord says, well, i gotta, got to have this person, got to, you know, Jessica's got to be more, Adam's got to, Andrew's got to be more, we got to, you know, I was born in that, you come, I, I, well, I was born, but, because he's an old guy, you know. <laughs> he's like 30-something, you know, or something, you know. But did you ever think about that? A lot of the dreams that many of us have and we thought about 30 years ago, and just now coming to pass, some of the people involved in it weren't even born. God's timing's perfect. You set your faith, you believe God, and don't sweat the small stuff. But there always is that pastoral impatience. I thought I'd be so far along, I, I thought we'd have 10,000 people by now, to be honest with you. And then after I grow, and I think, you know, it's amazing any of you show up and listen to me. <laughs> I'm always amazed when people show up now. But the reality is, guys, in our lives, God's timing is perfect. And I'm not saying he's holding off on your healing. That's not what I'm talking about. Because it's not like, well, the Lord will heal me someday. No, the Lord heals right now. But I'm talking about relationships and business and ministries and different things. We have to submit to the process, and the process usually is uncomfortable. The Lord would talk to me about pastoring a church of a thousand people. And then we have a thousand people in our church and the services now, probably. And with all the services combined, probably a thousand people in our church. And, and, and I saw it happen, and I could see it, and I, and I could see things happening, but... I wanted to quit so many times. Oh, I can't tell you how many times that things got tough. I mean tough. We had, I call it the seven, the seven years of drought. 
before before we had some years that were just dead. I mean, it's like, you know, I mean, their good ministry took place, but it wasn't what we wanted with the, the dream. And now we're seeing things. But what happens if I would have unhooked somewhere down that road? What happens if you would have bailed out of that marriage? What happens if you would have quit that business? Oh, I'm just so tired and these people and I hate employees and I can't deal with all these people and da 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 and down the road, something changes in the atmosphere. Something changes, and God's got you at the right place at the right time. And next thing you know, you go, how did we get here? I'm believing God for some how did we get here moments for you. How many of you need one of those how did we get here moments? I just want to pray for you this morning. Can we just conclude this service by just praying for you this morning? I just, maybe, maybe this message speaking to you, maybe your impatience is, I don't know, but it just, if you want me to pray for you, just, maybe just stand to your feet right now. Just, maybe there's something you want prayer for, just stand, stand to your feet, or just, yeah, come on, somebody's got to break the ice here. That may, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray for one of those, how did we get here moments? Some of you single people, well, every single person probably needs to be standing right now. Submit to the process. Submit to the process. That process is painful. I remember, and I'm almost done, but I remember I was making big money. Back in 1979, I was making $15.25 an hour. Man, that's like $50 an hour today. I was making good money. And the Lord said, go to Bible school. I submitted to the process. And it went from fifteen twenty-five an hour to three twenty-five an hour in just a couple weeks. Man, that cramps your Harley style. It cramped my style. But I'm so thankful that I submitted to the process. I'm so thankful I didn't chase finances over the dream of building something here. I'm going to pray for you. Let's ble- I'm going to believe God with you. I'm going to set my faith with you. You're believing God for that child to come home to get right. You're believing for that business to take off. You're believing for that, that ministry to take off. You're believing for that building. You're believing for that house. You're believing for that thing. Don't be discouraged if you're told no on the next step. Because we're not trusting a step. We're trusting a God. The God. The King of Kings. I'm going to stretch my hands out towards you and pray. As I sweep this auditorium, just know that your pastor is standing behind you. And you're submitting, and by this, by you standing, you're submitting to the process today. Now, Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I start on my right and your left, and I, and I just speak to every single person standing right now. They had the guts to stand up. I thank you, Father God, for the timing of the Lord right now in their life. If you could fulfill 456 prophecies exactly like they were supposed to, then you can fulfill every single person standing, their life and the process of their life. And so I speak right now, that spouse, that ministry, that house, that building, that child, that spouse coming back. Father, I speak life to their situation right now in the name of Jesus. I speak life to them, Father, right now. Angels of God, go forth right now and even speed that process up speed that process up and I bind the power of unbelief that would come against them and derail the plan and the purpose of God I speak it right now in the name of Jesus thank you father for the healing power of God flowing healing power God wants you healed now it's not a process he wants you healed now so we speak healing right now in the name of Jesus thank you father for your perfect timing in your situation father coming together in jesus name we pray and if you agree that would you say amen do we have some prayer requests or let me just pray let's everybody stand up real quick this came through our prayer our prayer phone cancer lots of pain broken neck car accident back and doesn't want the the back problem doesn't want surgery father i lift these up to you and i thank you father god for the healing power of god I thank you, Father God, for every need met represented on this card right now in the name of Jesus. Healing power of God flow right now in Jesus' name we pray. 
And I thank you, Father God, for every need met. Now we pray for the people that we will invite this next week. Father, I just thank you that now, now let me just say this to you. Maybe just look up here for half a second, then I'm going to pray. Some of you have been believing God for relatives. Bringing them to church, maybe on a Christmas service, might be the seed that, that starts to germinate and grow in their life. Be part of the process. A neighbor that might, you might think they're the most ornery cuss you've ever seen in your life, but you bringing them to church might be the power of God, might break them down, and you might be part of that process in seeing them come to Jesus. I pray for every single person that's going to invite people next week. Pray that their hearts will be open, lives will be changed, touched by the power of God. We thank you for it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Church, if you agree with that, shout amen.